Lucky should be coming in here in a minute. Here she comes. Good morning, Mr. President. Prime Minister of Finland. Well, Prime Minister, welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you have you here. And Mr. Vito? And the Ambassador? Hello, Mr. President. And our ambassador. Well, good morning, Mr. President. President. Very good to see you. see you. Well, come in. Mr. President, uh, it's a great honor to meet with you, Mr. President. May I extend to you, Mr. President, the best wishes of the Dr. Mauno Koivisto, the President of Finland, and uh, his uh, warm welcome to you to Finland later this month. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in uh, 1988, our two nations are celebrating uh, the 350th anniversary of uh, the first arrival of the, fir the arrival of the first fin uh, Finnish uh, settlers in the New World. And uh, you, Mr. President, you have kindly proclaimed uh, 1988 as the National Year of Friendship. Yes. We Finns, Finns are very proud uh, of their contribution to the American nation and uh, proud of the long-standing friendship with you. Uh, may I present to you, Mr. President, the first copy of a special commemorative medal cast in Finland uh, to honor this uh, year of jubilee. Uh, it, uh, symbolizes uh, the pioneer spirit the friends brought uh, to this country and um, as well uh, the bonds to keep the spirit alive and um, as well our esteem to you as alive. Thank you, Mr. Well. Thank you very much. 1638. Yes. Well, that's, I'm very proud and pleased to have this. We observed these 350 years and began not too far from Washington here. That first colony was in what is now Wilmington, Delaware. Well, thank you. Most proud to have this. And please give my regards to President Kodvisto. And uh, once again, welcome to Finland on the, your very important trip to Moscow. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I've heard a great deal from George Schultz about uh, your hospitality, and we're looking forward to it. We are doing our best to serve you, Mr. President. Well, 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 thank you very much. And come in here and let us sit down for a few minutes. Uh, I think you know some of the people who are here. Prime Minister, you, you met Howard Baker. Prime Minister, I'm Howard Baker. Oh, good gentleman. 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 Good Thanks to you, Mr. President. You'll keep them. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we have the same experience here. that he has enjoyed, and uh, I have never had the opportunity to visit your country before, and I'm looking forward to it. Right, thank you. 
Some 16 million new jobs. <clears throat> That's raising employment to an all-time high. The highest percentage of the potential employment pool ever employed in our history is at work today. 62.3% of that potential pool. <clears throat> and uh, inflation is low. Uh, basic industries and factories are expanding. And there's good news on trade. Exports are at record levels and the trade deficit has turned around. Since the third quarter of 1986, the volume of American merchandise exports has been growing almost four times as fast as the volume of imports. The result is that when you account for price changes, the real trade deficit is now 23% smaller than it was then. Our trading partners are learning an important fact. When American business goes into the world market to compete, it plays to win. The bottom line, I'm happy to tell you, is that the economic outlook is excellent. In fact, the only threat to our economy comes from those who would raise taxes, put up trade barriers, and burden our businesses with excessive regulations, like the plant closing layoff provision in the omnibus trade bill. Some people seem to find prosperity unbearable politically, <laughs> and then they come up with all sorts of schemes to turn America back to where it was seven years ago and rail, roll back our economic gains. We won't let them do it. The prosperity the American people have achieved will not be rolled back. It'll be preserved and built upon. You have my word on that. And you have about Bob Michael in Congress, making sure that what the American people have won, they keep. 
I want our legacy to be an America confident of its future, prosperous at home, a leader in the world, and I've never felt more optimistic than I do today about the future of our great country. Now, before I thank you and go back to work or something, maybe one or two of you might have thought of something and said, if I ever had a chance, I'd like that. <laughs> Straight out in Panama. <laughs> when are we going to get things straightened out in Panama? When the canal rolls up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know that you're serious in the question, and I, I just you can't say a time, and I can't talk about specifics with regard to all that we're trying to do, but we are using every effort. And it is a very frustrating situation. Uh, certainly, I think you would all agree, we couldn't walk in there with military force and kidnap him and do that. We would lose every friend we've got in Latin America. I have noticed it's an amazing thing. My first couple of years here, I made a trip down around some of the countries of Latin America. And when I came in, you could just see the kind of waiting here comes another big plan from the Colossus in the north. Well, I know we've gone down there with some plans before, but I told them I was down there to find out what they wanted, what their ideas were. And I emphasized that we were all Americans from the pole all the way down to Tierra del Fuego and had common interests and so forth. You'd be surprised how surprised they were. <laughs> and then, and, but the one thing I did learn from them, they want our help in every way. They want what I was talking about, but they all let me know, no, they didn't want the Marines to land uh, <laughs> down there. They, they'll, they'll take care of that part of it. And I guess that's from a history of when we were the big colossus of the North, and <clears throat> even well-intentioned as we were, why we went down kind of giving the orders. So we can't do that not in Panama of all places, but we are exploring every avenue, and we're negotiating. We have a man there that's talking to them, and some of the speculation in the press is just purely that speculation. They don't know what they're talking about when they talk about <laughs> Panama. But we're determined we have to get that man out of power. Has there been any thought given to changing the format of press conferences? They seem to have become so adversarial. Well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> It's true, every once in a while, you know, we've invited people in here from the media outside the Beltway, from all across the country, representatives of local radio stations and the press in those communities. There's just all the difference in the world. Those questions are legitimate questions for news and for answers. And you're right, the relationship here with the Washington Press Corps has become adversarial. You're, you're in a contest, and they're there to catch you on something if they, if they can. And, uh, I'm, it's, it's very frustrating, and frankly, that's why we haven't had any more than we have. Why? Why waste our time? Mr. President, I know you've tried, and I know you know that the result of tax reform has not been simplicity, but what do we do in the future about getting simplicity into our tax laws? <laughs> well, we think that a lot, of, a lot of this is the transfer. The going into it has accounted for a lot of the, of the uh, not simplifying that we're seeking there. We really think the main features of the, of the plan do simplify it, and we think it'll get better past this. But also, we have to tell you that some things were added in that were not part of our idea of tax reform, and uh, they became a part of it. And some of them, I think they have contributed uh, to the lack of simplifying. Now, we've been sensitive to being outnumbered as we are, uh, up against a, a majority of the other party in both houses. Uh, the policy mainly would be tax increase if they had their way. We've been restrained in trying to go in and get changes in some of those things that were brought into the program for fear of opening up right now the whole thing to another contest of which we wouldn't know how it, it might turn out. But. Uh, we think that the, the total analysis of it, and it has been a success, it's a success to the point that with lower rates, 
we're proving what I have always believed was an economic fact. The revenues are going up, not down. You know, it was, my degree was in economics. So those are the only ethnical stories, jokes I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, I believe there was a man many, a few, well, several centuries ago named Ibn Khaldun, and he was an absolute economist. He made a statement then. He said, in the beginning of the empire, the rates were low and the revenue was great. At the end of the empire, the rates were great and the revenue was low. So I've always believed that if you look at our own history, tax cuts usually re re resulted in more revenue. Mr. President, I wanted to say that. Um, how do you feel about them trying to chip away at the presidential powers? Well, that's been going on for a long time before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> the devil of it is they've succeeded in a large, to a large part. And I think uh, an evidence of that, I think, was in 1974 when the Congress really took over the budgeting and kind of shut out the, the president uh, from some of the powers that he had. And we've been in trouble uh, budget-wise ever since. But uh, I'm, I've tried to fight for it. I don't want to leave a heritage to another president. As a matter of fact, when I'm out of this job, so people won't be able to accuse me that I'm doing it for myself. I'm going out on the mashed potato circuit and see if I can't get back some things and get something that I had as a governor and that 43 governors have, and that is a line item veto. Yeah. sucker for style. Uh, we've all read about uh, what reporters tell us, your impressions of Gorbachev bar and class knocks, etc. but could you share with us a minute uh, your personal revelations? Well, I have to tell you, he is different than the other ones before him, because I had a problem meeting with the other ones before him and kept dying. <laughs> For one thing, he is trying to jump over Stalin, who, you know, changed everything from Lenin and get back to some of the things Lenin said. And if you study Lenin a little bit, you will find that Lenin was one that talked about uh, working alongside capitalists. And as he said, you'll learn from them. And it was Stalin who came in and said, no, sir, and it was Stalin whose idea was we must we must take the world. We must make the world a one world communist state. And uh, many of the things he's trying here, but he's up against great opposition. Now there's, there's one, one of his programs, and I was shocked the other day to learn that if he got, if, if he got the program that he'd asked for, 400,000 bureaucrats would have to give up their cars and private drivers. Now, uh, you know, they don't do that easy. <laughs> But at the same time, he believes in communism. He believes that uh, in that in that program, and uh, yet there's an entirely different relationship in, in working with him. Uh, he he's an affable fellow. I've told him a couple of stories that his own people are telling in Russia about their system, and he got belly laughs from him. Well, getting to those questions, it'll take too much time. <laughs> Maybe just one more. I know the president's been very generous for this time, but let's conclude. Mr. Mr. President, uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, as a migrant, living my, I left my native Nigeria 25 years ago. It is uh, a crystallization of a dream for me to be uh, so the first standing in your presence, and uh, I am grateful to belong to the district of uh, Congressman Michaels and to be a part of this wonderful delegation from, uh, from Illinois. The question that has been bugging me, Mr. President, is uh, the problem of uh, sanctions. One that has set up rules and regulations for their employees that are similar to what we have here, that they can graduate to supervisory <coughs> positions uh, over whatever employees, mix of employees there are. In other words, in their own running of the companies over there. 
they have abolished apartheid, you might say, in those countries. And I have, I have uh, had visits here with, uh, for example, a man I respect very much as a statesman, and that is Budalese, the head of the, of the Zulu uh, tribes in, in South Africa. And he feels that same way, that this is not the road, that there is a better way of, and I've tried on the other side to get them, the government, to consult with them and start dealing with people like that in a way to bring an end to what is a shameful practice of apartheid. But uh, the, the other things, that, the things that we have done, have not been helpful. You can't hurt the people who want to help. They're doing it. Incidentally, may I say, about you and welcome here, I got a letter that explains something I never thought of it this way. A man wrote me not too long ago, and he said, you know, in this country, he said, you can go to France to live in France, but you can't become a Frenchman. You can go to Germany or Greece or Turkey. You, you can't become a German or a Turk or a Greek. But he said, in this country, Anyone from any corner of the world can come to America and become an American. I'm proud to be one. Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can go into the Kremlin to the General Secretary's office. I can pound his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> I've seen you before. Do you yes, I've never talked to you. Yeah. 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 Instead of 
10 minutes, you have 20 minutes, despite yeah. of the job you feel waiting outside. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You satisfy the press? Mm -hmm. You satisfy the press or the yes. talk? <laughs> Mr. President, I would like to, to urge you to, for a few points, and if you go there to Moscow, for big equipment that I will read, because I want to forget. I urge you, Mr. President, to remain firm in your support for the legalization of the Ukrainian Catholic Church and Ukrainian Orthodox Churches. Keep the issue of the legalization of the churches as an item on the summit agenda. Since the Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukrainian Catholic Churches are both direct descendants of the Kiev Rus legacy, the millennium of Christianity provides an excellent opportunity for the resurrection of the Ukrainian Churches. Further, I discourage you, Mr. President, from visiting Danilo's monastery or any other institution symbolic to the Soviet-controlled Russian Orthodox Church, because a such a visit will play into the Soviet agenda to Russify this millennium of Christianity and will downplay Ukrainians' direct historic claim to this event. B, such a visit would de devastate millions of Ukrainian Christians who risked their lives to practice their religion in the clandestine underground church. They put their hopes on our president, because we might present too, <coughs> to understand and publicly support, support their struggle for a fundamental freedom, the right to worship in their native Ukrainian churches. Please remind, uh, I remind you, Mr. President, that just sign, you signed congressional resolution that discourages official U.S. participation in Millennium events as long as Ukrainian churches are not legalized. Mr. President, despite glasses, persecution continues the Kremlin's liberalization, the Soviet control of the Russian Orthodox Church is a political motivated shame and does not allow for true religious freedom. I urge you, Mr. President, to publicly <coughs> manifest your support for Ukrainian churches when you travel to Moscow. I urge you, Mr. President, to meet Ukrainian Catholic and Ukrainian Orthodox leaders, in particular leader, leaders of the underground churches. So it is my begging you for those things to remember. Well, Your Honor, let me say I'm, I'm a little tied with regard to the, to the monastery <laughs> visit. That's <laughs> a little forced on. But I can assure you that because I'm on this subject, I'm going to deal with him one on one, yeah. just when the two of us are, are alone. So, and I have taken up the subject before. Uh, and I think that the approach that I'm taking there is one that tries to head off uh, his accepting it as interference in their internal I'm, I'm putting it on a basis of a suggestion that will help him in his own problems if he proceeds. And I very much am going to be calling attention to the fact that the millennium they celebrate yes. began in that's Kiev, that's Bruce. Right. Yes. And they didn't exist at that time. They came to existence 200 years later. So how could we baptize before we were born? <laughs> for me, it's simple and possible. Yes. But for them, it's everything possible. But I assure you, I'm going to do my best on that. And I have already once before broached that subject here, just between the two of us, uh, uh, and for all faiths yes. there, that uh, uh, when he was complaining about the emigration and what it would do to his country and so forth, and I tried to suggest to him that maybe so many people wouldn't feel like emigrating if they could worship God in their own way in their own country. And feel good on <laughs> Yes. So I can assure you, I'm not going to give up on that. I'm going to do my best. Thank you very much, President, Mr. President. We will pray for your safe going and coming back. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I believe in it very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. But I believe if, you know, if there's any thought that it's not out in the open, like a treaty or something, no, no. Uh, I think the right way is to urge him yeah. and to actually, uh, well, to actually persuade him that uh, I would stand back and just give him credit for doing that. I would not appear <laughs> to take any credit. It is good to need, need to be <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very, very much, Mr. President. I am encouraged that even though it, right now the more first movie he's made has been with the Orthodox yeah. Church, and, uh, I could understand that happening, but I think there's a, there's a, a, a chance that he is wanting to move this way. But he's afraid himself. He's what? He's afraid himself. Oh, yes, and because he's got great opposition within the government that's right. there. That's right. Then not to make a wrong move. Okay. He might be like Khrushchev, out of the business. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure he knows that. He knows about And yet he's gone farther than uh, anyone has. Yes. And uh, he's done a pretty good job of surrounding himself with people that he's trying believe to. in him. That's right. So let's hope that he succeeds yes. and that you, Mr. President, succeed. Well, believe me. Be helped. <laughs> believe be me. I, th I think this is more important than anything we're trying to negotiate yes, is this particular facet. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't want to bother you anymore because, you know, you're, you're tired not already. <laughs> you're not bothering me at all. And, uh, God bless you. Appreciate and you keep you well all the time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm fine, and thank you so very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about some matters of very great importance to North Carolina. It's Colonel Dan McDonald, and you know Secretary Whatever. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Hello there. Where would you like first? Thank you, sir. I come on business on behalf of my state, and appreciate very much your arranging this so that we can meet. I've had a chance at least to discuss this with everyone else here. Colonel McDonald has been associated with this project for a long time, and uh, we are prepared to get into it whenever would be the best suitable occasion. Well, we can right now. I know there's something about it that's been, that's been on the books for 20 years, yeah. and uh, almost. And uh, But I do know that I have not it. Yes, well, well, we can surely get into those and bring you up to speed. Let me hand out some uh, uh, booklets that will give me an easy reference, uh, Colonel Dan, if you have those, because it can, it can introduce not only where the project is and the potential of it, but what's been going on there and the safety factors. Um, and I'll be referring to, first of all, to the first uh, drawing that's in there, just to show its relationship. I believe it's one just to hit that. Just to show its relationship on the coast. Uh, most people wouldn't realize that that uh, Pamlico Sound is about the same size as the entire Chesapeake Bay. And you can include the smaller sound to the north of it, which is the Albemarle Sound, and it has the same uh, surface side. Now, it has no shipping because there's no entrance for, for that character, and nor would this be one. And it's not deep enough for that. But it's a beautiful area. You see Argon Inlet now. Ich überbringe Ihnen die Größe Ihres Freundes Helmut Kohl, des Bundeskanzlers der Wunderlichen Deutschland. Und ich habe für Sie ein Geschenk. Sie haben sicherlich den Begriff Fulda Gap in Ihren Ohren. Aber es gibt auch eine Fulda Stadt. But there's also Fulda, there's not only Fulda money, there's Und das also Fulda money about Fulda. And that is my home, 1200 Jahre alt. It's 1200 years old. Und da gibt das yeah. 11. amerikanische Panzeraufklärungsregiment. And the 11th American tank regiment und damit Sie sehen, dass das eine schöne Stadt ist und dort and to show you that that's a very beautiful liegen zu ihr ihr Menschenleben, that there are charming people möchte ich Ihnen das gerne überreichen als kleines Geschenk. This as a small gift. Well, thank you very much. Und das ist eine Botschaft von Helmut Kohl für Sie and persönlich. Ich werde Ihnen nachher erläutern. To you personally well, from Helmut Kohl. Thank you and Danke, Herr Friedrich. Thank you. Thank you. My very best regards. Das ist von Michael Geiger. Vorsitzende der Außenpolitiker in der CDU-CSU-Fraktion. Herr Wimmer, Verteidiger. Herr Wimmer, Verteidiger. Herr Präsident, bevor ich die Botschaft von Herrn Moskow erläutere, möchte ich Ihnen noch mal von ganzem Herzen danken. 
für das, was Sie als Präsident für den Mut und das Selbstbewusstsein der Amerikaner und damit der ganzen Allianz getan haben. Herzlichen Dank. Mr. President, before I will explain to you the message by Chancellor Cole, which I'm bringing with me, I would like to thank you for everything that you have done as a president to increase the courage and the self-confidence of the citizens of the United States, of your country, and of the Alliance. Well, 